obesity isn't just about the numbers on a scale. It's about a complex web of health challenges it brings. From diabetes and hypertension to sleep apnea and joint pain, obesity casts uh, a long shadow uh, over our well-being. But what if there is a beacon of hope in this shadow? What if bariatric surgery, with its potentials to shed excess weight, also offers relief from these burdensome comorbidities? Today, we are going to dive into um, a fascinating topic of resolution of more, uh, the comorbidities with uh, bariatric surgery, and we will untangle science behind bariatric surgery and its impact on various comorbidities. There are uh, so many uh, other illnesses. We call comorbidity. You don't like when I do comorbidity when I call it uh, comorbidities, but let's call them other illnesses uh, alongside with morbid obesity. And uh, one of the, I guess, very uh, effective part of this powerful tool, bariatric surgery, is uh, the impact, the changes that we see uh, in other illnesses that person may be having. And as an expert, you are going to tell us what you see, uh, what you have, uh, what you have seen with your patients, and what are the uh, other uh, help of uh, bariatric surgery. So that's what we would like to discuss. Absolutely, absolutely. Kamal, if you look at the top causes of mortality in our country, in the United States, you will see at the top cardiovascular disease, which includes heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke. You will see metabolic diseases, which include things like type 2 diabetes. You will see cancers, right? And surprise, surprise, obesity is closely related to the development of all these major causes of uh, disease as well as death in our country, right? So it is no surprise then that people who have morbid obesity also tend to have a shorter lifespan because with obesity, we have a concurrent uh, disease, including high blood pressure, as you mentioned in your introduction, type 2 diabetes, and other illnesses, including cancers, right? So interestingly, the existence of these diseases alongside obesity is not coincidental. It's actually causative, right? Obesity actually, as a disease, causes these other illnesses as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can look into the uh, scientific uh, reasons for that, but without that, we can just do observational studies, right? You have about three out of four patients who have high blood pressure are obese patients, come on, right? In about 90% of cases, type two diabetes is caused by obesity, right? So there is such a close correlation between the existence of these illnesses and obesity that it is no surprise that when we focus on obesity as the main culprit and get rid of it, come on, we see resolution or improvements in these other illnesses as well. So before really the uh, popularization of bariatric surgery, the way it is now, especially among healthcare workers, right? Among the general population, there is still not enough knowledge of bariatric surgery. And that's why I'm so thankful for you having this uh, session has come out because we want to get this information out. But among healthcare workers, the understanding of this miracle cure that can take care of many illnesses in one go has uh, taken hold now, right? So 15, 20, 25 years ago, you would go to see a doctor, right? And they would measure your blood pressure and say, oh, you have high blood pressure, mm -hmm. right? Here is medication for it. And then they send you for blood work and they find out that your blood sugar is too high. Oh, you have type two diabetes. Here is medication right? Oh, you are very tired during the day. Oh, let's check for sleep apnea. You have sleep apnea. Here is a machine to take care of it, right? Let's do screening. Oh, we've done mammogram. You have breast cancer. We've done colonoscopy. You have colon cancer. And yet with all that, the discussion about obesity, which is right front and center, 
was not there in those days, come on, right? Now things are changing. Uh, healthcare uh, uh, doctors really are understanding that the central problem is obesity. So when they see a patient who has morbid obesity, mm -hmm. rightly they focus on that. And then they explain that the high blood pressure, the type two diabetes, the sleep apnea, the risk for those cancers is actually related to it. So addressing obesity will also address all these illnesses. So it is very, very important now to understand that when patients have high blood pressure, they are also at risk for many other illnesses come out. They are at risk of heart disease. They are at risk for stroke. They are at risk for kidney disease. And kidney failure and dialysis are terrible problems that are extremely difficult to treat. With bariatric surgery, actually the same mechanisms that lead to weight loss actually influence the metabolism of the person in a beneficial way. So there is almost like an independent improvement of things like type 2 diabetes just because of the procedures. Mm -hmm. So much so that, Kamal, that right now there are places in the world, not yet in the United States, places in the world where bariatric surgery, particularly in the form of gastric bypass, is being offered as a first-line treatment for type 2 diabetes independent of the weight of the people, right? So you can have people with a body mass index of 27, 28 with type two diabetes, they are being offered gastric bypass as a definitive treatment. And why is this happening? This is happening because for many people, type two diabetes is a never going away illness. It's an illness that they will take to their grave, right? It's chronic, problem, right? And even when the best control with the best medication is the risk of amputationist, the risk of blindness, the risk of uh, kidney failure, the risk of heart disease or stroke remains with that person when they have type 2 diabetes. That's why many doctors are advocating the uh, use of metabolic surgery. That's how they call bariatric surgery, even in instances where the weight issue is not that much great, right? So when we say if you have obesity, if you have morbid obesity and type 2 diabetes, bariatric surgery should be something you need to look into. Bariatric surgery should be something your doctors should be uh, asking you to consider. It's because it's based on that, Kamal, because we are able not only to liberate that person from the burden of obesity, but also this very, very dangerous illnesses like type 2 uh, diabetes. Okay, absolutely. This is the day, right? The day of surgery, very, very important day, a milestone, as you mentioned, uh, for patients who have been uh, obviously looking forward to this for a very long time. Looking forward in the sense that they know it's a way for them to liberate themselves from the ravages of morbid obesity, but also it's a day of having surgery. So some apprehension alongside that is also very common. In fact, patients tell me very often they are excited and apprehensive at the same time. And my answer to that is really the right combination of emotions when uh, you know, expecting uh, uh, the surgery day. And as we have said in many of our sessions before, the process really to get to that day is fairly extensive as the patients have to go through uh, evaluation that includes you know, visits with nutritionists, with psychologists, with other medical specialists, including possibly cardiology and others. And they will have done many medical tests as well. And that is really to optimize their situation for the surgery. So the day of surgery really for the patients starts really in the middle of the night of that day. So at midnight of the day of surgery, patients have to do certain important preparation. One of them is that they cannot have anything to eat or drink after midnight of that day. Right, so that's a that's an instruction that they will have from their surgeon, from the uh, bariatric center. Uh, there is there is an exception to that, however, and the exception is they are able to take medications that are necessary uh, for them with a sip of water, right, and that is acceptable. Now, this is actually important as well because there may be some medications that are critical for them to continue taking. This could be medications for high blood pressure, for instance. They could be medications for anxiety or other uh, mental health uh, uh, issues. 
but there may also be medications that they have to uh, stop taking on the day of surgery. All those are obviously very individual situations that will have to be thoroughly discussed with their surgeon before their surgery. So if they have medications that they have been instructed to take, they should take them with a sip of water. On top of these medications that patients may have, there are actually some medications that the bariatric center will instruct patients to take before they come to the bariatric center on that morning. Now, are there certain medications that we want them to avoid though? Of course, of course. So uh, for instance, if a patient has uh, type two diabetes, and they take, let's say, metformin, that would be a medication we would not want them to take because if they do, then their blood sugar could be driven too far down at the time of anesthesia, and the anesthesiologist obviously would not like that. Mm -hmm. But as I said, there are these are individual situations, and it is important that at their surgical clearance visit that they discuss with their surgeon which medication is to hold off and which medication is to, they should be taking. Our medical record will have a list of their medications. So we know what medication they're on and we will tell them, but it's important for them to really have that clarified in their head, okay? But now, as I said, there are certain medication the Beatrix Center actually will or may ask the patients to take. For instance, we like our patients to take Tylenol extra strength before they come to our surgery center. Now, people may find this uh, puzzling to, to, why would I want to take Tylenol? Well, one of the things we do in our surgery center really is to prepare the patients for a comfortable recovery. Not necessarily painless recovery, but a recovery where pain is really very well controlled. And one of the things we do is actually provide pain medication ahead of the surgery itself in order to really prepare them to have less uh, discomfort. And it has been proven if you uh, give patients Tylenol before the surgery, actually, you are able to uh, mitigate the amount of discomfort that they will have uh, after the surgery. So uh, if they uh, are instructed to do that, obviously, they need to take the Tylenol extra strength at home, perhaps about an hour or so before they come to the surgery center, again, with a sip of water. Mm -hmm. All right. Tylenol extra strength is very important. They clarify this as well because sometimes people think Tylenol pain medication is similar to Motrin, it's similar to ibuprofen. These are very different medications that have very different effects. So it's important for them to be very clear in my mind about the instructions that they are giving. So they come to the surgery center, as you said, usually it's about two hours prior to their allotted time for surgery and they will be registered uh, at our um, in our lobby, and then they will be going to you know with the nurse to the preparation area. Well, they will be changing into a gown, and that preparation will start really with a number of questions asked by the nurse to them, but also by other people. And they may find that these questions are repetitive, right? That there will be a number of people that will come and ask them same questions. When was the last time you had anything to eat or drink, for instance? Or what medications have you taken? And patients may think this is redundant, right? But it's really part of our safety process. And redundancy is very important in medicine, right? You have to have different layers of safety so that different people will come from different angles to ask the same questions to confirm that the facts stated are really the fact, right? This is important for safety reasons. Very often patients will find it uh, strange that their surgeon will ask them, oh, what surgery are you having today? Well, the surgeon is asking that because, not because the surgeon does not know, but because the surgeon wants to confirm as part of the safety process from the mouth of the patient that they are understanding what surgery they are having. And this is part of the informed consent process as well, right? Patients need to understand clearly what procedure they are having, what are the indications for that procedure, what are the potential risks, complications, and expected outcome, the commitment that is needed for that expected outcome. All these are part of the uh, informed consent process that will be starting earlier on in their first counter, but it will be repeated through the process until they are also in the preparation area where this uh, uh, conversation will be rehashed again and will be rehashed by different people. So I don't want patients to be surprised by that. It is a very important part of our uh, safety process. Uh, the operation in the OR is about like 60 to 85 minutes average in the OR. 
Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. So that would be right. Yeah. So for instance, sometimes if it's a revisional procedure, it could take a little bit longer than that. But for most people, that's really the average time that they will be in the operating time, right? Bariatric surgery has become an extremely safe procedure, right? In a way, uh, the fact that it has been treated morbid obesity, which is a condition that has been so highly stigmatized in our society, has made uh, bariatric surgeons the target also, not only of the society in general, but also of the uh, medical establishment for many years as doctors who were really treating something that was not uh, needed, right? Uh, as you recall, it's only been uh, less than 10, 15 years since they, even the American Medical Association actually classified obesity as a disease. So we've gone for many years without really recognizing obesity as a disease. Therefore, bariatric surgery was seen in a fairly bad light for many years, and it had to really legitimize itself. Uh, because of that, bariatric surgery has been under enormous scrutiny, right? And we had to really show that not only we have uh, we had a great uh, effective treatment at hand, but we had to make sure that it was safe as well. And because of that, bariatric surgery has undergone tremendous uh, study, um, probably one of the best studies surgical procedures currently, right? And as a result, we have made huge improvements in safety to the extent that complex procedures like uh, gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy now, Kamal, have the same safety profile as gallbladder surgery, hysterectomy. In fact, there are some papers that show even greater complication rate for gallbladder surgery compared to bariatric surgery. So that's where we are. So short-term complications of the different types of surgeries, you know, and we obviously have the gastric bypass, the gastric sleeve, the most commonly done procedure, which are procedures that are intended to somehow modify the digestive tract, uh, infection can occur. Infection can occur in the short term uh, because the stomach has not healed well, the intestine has not healed well, a leakage can happen, right? This can lead to a very serious infection. The good news, as I said, is again, this is an extremely rare event in programs like ours. Uh, where we've achieved such great levels of safety. But even if it occurs, obviously, we can take care of it, right? When does this type of infection tend to occur? Well, it tends to occur in the first 30 days, perhaps in the first six weeks after the surgery, right? And when we tell our patients about this complication, we also instruct them about calling us if they have certain symptoms, right? Whether it's abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, all these could be signs of a potential complication and they need to alert us so we can take care of it in a timely fashion. Other things that can happen early after surgery include things like blood clots, right? Blood clots that can happen in the legs, that can travel into the lungs. This could be serious complications, come on. But again, we've made big strides in minimizing this complication. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, increased risks for blood clots, uh, come on, in any type of surgery, are patients with a high weight. So our patients, by definition, have an increased risk for blood clots when they undergo surgery. Because we've recognized that we've gone out of our way really to uh, place uh, prevention measures that have helped us greatly. In fact, as you know, uh, all our patients just before surgery get a blood thinning medication, right? Because we do our surgeries laparoscopically right now. The risk of bleeding has decreased greatly compared to the past when we used to do open surgery and we had the surgeon's big hands inside the abdomen manipulating structures, which had a high rate for bleeding, for instance, right? We don't do that. We use laparoscopy, which is very tiny instruments that manipulate the tissues very delicately. So the risks of major uh, bleeding is very low. In fact, uh, uh, after laparoscopic surgery, one of the questions the anesthesiologist will ask the surgeon is, hey, what was the blood loss with this surgery? And normally it's two cc, two mLs for such a big procedure, come on, right? Mm -hmm. So bleeding is minimal. And because we're so comfortable with our ability to control bleeding, then we can give blood thinning medication to protect against blood clots, right? So, um if you were to go into long-term risk and complications, so if you can also summarize those, and then I may have some questions. 
Absolutely, absolutely. So there are really two important ones to keep in mind, right? One is potential malnutrition, right? So lack of nutrients. This is much more common with gastric bypass and relatively less with the sleeve gastrectomy. And the reason is simple. When we do gastric bypass, we are rerouting the intestine to make it unable to absorb nutrients well. Well, because we want the patient to absorb less calories, but and side effect of that is that their ability to absorb very important, what we call micronutrients like minerals, like vitamins also decreases. So to make up for that, we want our patients to be on vitamins and micronutrients for the rest of their life. Not only that, we want them to commit to follow up with us in the long term as well. So we can do blood tests repeatedly, right? If those things are not in place, then the patient is in danger of becoming vitamin deficient or mineral deficient. And if these things are not taken care of, they can be very serious. The person could be at risk for hair loss. They could be at risk for weakening of their bones. They could be at risk for uh, poor healing or being vulnerable to infections. They could be at risk for irreversible nerve damage. So these are serious issues. So once a patient committed to something like gastric bypass, they also have to commit to taking these uh, additional supplements for the rest of their lives. Not only that, they have to have a medical person supervise them so that they can do tests on an ongoing basis to make sure that these vitamins are in place. This happens a little bit less frequently with the sleeve gastrectomy because we don't reroute the intestine, but even the sleeve gastrectomy requires careful attention to vitamins and micronutrients in the long run.